So basically, Victor has already mentioned the basic uh, functions of how subliminal laser works. And really, uh, he didn't mention this in detail. I'm just going to talk about duty cycle. So every time you're performing uh, any sort of laser on the eye, you want to consider the duty cycle, which is the amount of time that the laser energy has been actually delivered to the retina. So in traditional old style laser, you have a 100% duty cycle. But when you're talking about subliminal laser, you really want a very low duty cycle of 5%, whereby you're actually just simulating the RPE cells, not intending to cause a burn in the RPE layer. And adjusting the on-off cycle allows you to manage the heat diffusion. Uh, so as the classic photodilation will be 100% duty cycle and really is a hot thermal burn, which causes a large scar the macula, which is there permanently, and it's easily visible on on fluorescent, uh, fluorescent angiography, autofluorescence, or OCT scan. Whereas if you're using a low duty cycle, you stimulate the RPE cells for a very short period of time, allow heat diffusion, and this allows the uh, uh, cooling effect on the tissues in the surrounding retina. So here, the benefits, as, as Victor has mentioned already, we can see similar efficacy results between the subliminal laser and the uh, classic, compared to classic ETRS style photocoagulation, and it has a durable effect. And you and the treatment strategy now is that we are combining with anti VEGF or steroids in the initial periods, and then for long term longevity of treatment, uh, the laser gives us a longest uh, duration where they can be treated without having to come back to clinic. There are limitations, as Victor mentioned, we can't see where we are treating. There's always been constant argument in the last few years over what treatment settings we should be using. And again, I, I would like to emphasize that the 577 millimeter is the best way frame to do subliminal laser because you're working on a macular region and you have low central veil pigment absorption by this laser. So Victor and his group uh, did some work with Ian Wong and his group in Hong Kong on, uh, on animal eyes. And they showed that at 5% duty cycle, there's really very little um, damage done to the retinal pigment epithelium layer. And this appears to be the ideal uh, duty cycle when you want to do subliminal laser. The key is to do a dense treatment. So you're using a large uh, area of 160 micron spot sizes, which are next to each other and contain contiguous. So we don't want to miss any areas. And this was the, uh, initially when we started doing subliminal laser uh, 10 years ago, we tended to go for small spot size uh, with large spacing in between the spots. And then we got them smaller. And then now we made the spot size bigger, and um, but we need to less laser spots as a result. So these are the treatment settings. You don't have to rem rem memorize this. I mean, the slides will be available if you want to see them. 160 micro spot size, 5% duty cycle, and two second exposure time. The most key important point of doing subliminal laser is to titrate the laser because everybody is different. Some patients have more pigmentation in the RPE layer. They require lower powers to achieve a result. Some patients who are less pigmented uh, may require higher power. Once you've, you, once you've achieved the, the thermal threshold, you reduce the thermal threshold by half, the power by 50, reduce it by 50% and then perform your laser. So the key step is to titrate the power. So you choose a spot in a macular periphery in a healthy area, adjust the spot size, I normally start at about 800 milliwatts, and then and then if I see a light burn, I'll reduce that by half to 400 milliwatts, and then I shouldn't see any burn there, and then I will then go on to treat the macular area that's edematous with this power. Um, I do not exceed 1.2 watts of power when I'm uh, doing this laser titration because uh, it's quite dangerous, and it's never necessary, to be honest. So then here, when you're in the, in the easy rep, uh, machine, you just choose a subliminal mode, and then uh, it will go on to the titration mode, whereby you can you can choose the power thresholds. I normally start at about uh, 800 milliwatts there at the highest, and then I will increase. You can increase it by 50 or reduce by 50 until you see a mid barely visible burn, and then you go to 50% power decrease, and then you can start your treatment. Finally. Uh, I would you then need to know where the, the area you need to treat is. Of course, with a macular laser lens, you can quite easily see thickened edematous areas. But nowadays, uh, because we have OCT thickness maps, I have the OCT scan next to the patient when I'm doing the laser 
just to remind myself of the actual uh, areas of thickness that have been seen on the OCT scan. So you don't see a visible reaction during the laser. Do not change the power because you've already titrated the power. You have to do a confluent lens treatment. <clears throat> For DME patients, I just use OCT thickness map. And I think in future uh, so up software upgrades, we, should, we will be able to overlay the OCT uh, scans onto your visualizations on, when you're looking through the, the slit lamp on the machine, and then you treat that area. For patients with CSCR, you do need a fluorescein angiogram to guide the treatment because it's very important to be very precise about where you are treating. Should you laser the fovea? This is a question that I get asked all the time. How close can you go to the fovea? Well, I would not recommend it because it really is not necessary, especially if you're new to doing this treatment, you might over-treat the fovea and damage the patient's central vision, and it's really not necessary. And, and you don't really need to go over the fovea. How long do you need to wait? For patients with diabetic macroedema, it takes about three months to see an effect from this laser. So you have to be patient. Uh, you have to tell the patients that it'll take at least three months to see an effect. Uh, for CSR, the effect is much faster at about six weeks. So really, um, for diabetic macroedema patients, it's ideal for the non-center evolving diabetic macroedema uh, because you can really treat those areas easily. For those with fovea involving, I would usually give anti vegf first um, to reduce the thickness, and then I would supplement it with some laser uh, at one month after anti vegf treatment to treat the remaining thickened areas, uh, avoiding the fovea at all times. Uh, and always remember that uh, anti vegf therapy can be added on at any time, uh, but I think with a combination of anti vegf with the subliminal laser, we are able to extend the, the visits that the patients need to come. For CSR, as I mentioned earlier, you need to ICG or fluorescein angiography, and it's an excellent alternative to half-fluence PDT. And really, this is my first-line treatment for CSCR, and there have been many papers published showing the efficacy of this compared with half-dose PDT, uh, or half-fluence PDT, sorry, uh, in treatment of CSCR. And certainly, as you know, PDT is a very cumbersome treatment. The drug and the laser are very difficult to obtain and it, it's, it's a real hassle having to set up the line for the patient and infuse the drug for 15 minutes before you treat them. So here are some clinical examples. Uh, uh, some images are courtesy of Dr. Ruiz from uh, Spain. Uh, here's a patient who had non-center involving diabetic macular edema and just uh, subliminal laser to the areas of thinner seen or OCT. And you can see at um, six months post single treatment of subliminal laser, there's resolution of the macular edema. If you have fovea involving macroedema, I would often give it anti vegf first to try and reduce the thickness. See them a month later, look at the OCT map, and then treat the OCT, the thickened areas with some minimal laser, and wait another three months, and you can see uh, three months after just one anti vegf and one subliminal laser, there's good resolution of the diabetic macroedema. And there's clinical trials ongoing about combinations of uh, subliminal laser combined with anti vegf therapy with center evolving uh, diabetic macroedema. And we look forward to this uh, trial results, which is being done in the Pan America Collaborative Retina Study. So, a bit about CSR. And this is some images also from Dr. Rios. Uh, and you can see that uh, fluorescein angiography has been done on a patient. macular laser but this usually resulted in a quite a macular scar which is quite close to the fovea uh, whereas with the subliminal laser you don't see a scar at all here's a patient with chronic csr after five months uh, And then uh, for after the second subliminal laser, it was completely dry six weeks later. So this patient had two sessions of subliminal laser, and you can see they required ICG to exclude polyps as well. Because sometimes 
uh, polio colorectal vasculopathy can masquerade as CSR. And this should, this should then be treated with combination of with anti vegf therapy as first line and then half fluence PDT if there's still polyps uh, causing visual loss. So finally, I'd like to share with you the subliminal laser therapy website where there's a whole range of cases and uh, different uh, all the discussions that we've had today. Uh, as you know, it's also available as a glaucoma treatment, but that is also a subject of an entire webinar by itself. 